Welcome to Grey Primer. My name is Nick. I'm your host, and in this week's episode, I'm doing something different. I'm going to look at the How to Paint Citadel Miniatures book. There's definitely treasure out there to be found when you search hard enough. Sometimes you just get lucky. Looking around old hobby shops, secondhand stores, bookshops. And one example of this is when I discovered the Citadel Miniatures uh, catalog from the year 2000. I'll add the link below to the read through I did of this in a previous video. And my next discovery was in a hobby shop stroke toy shop in Banbridge, also in Northern Ireland. And that was the Citadel Miniatures How to Paint book. Uh, a guide to painting armies for Lord of the Rings, Warhammer and Warhammer 40k. You can tell by the branding on Warhammer, and now I guess the branding on 40k, that this is a slightly older title. This is from 2014, so six years old at this stage. And uh, I thought it was just fantastic. It was all wrapped in plastic. It was perfect. I think it was a tenner they gave it to me for. It had been there for quite some time. And um, yeah, I was, I was thrilled. I didn't even know what it was. I didn't know why it had this wonky bit at the back. Uh, this hard card sort of um, stand. I, I couldn't work out what any of that was for it because it was all plastic wrap. So I took a gamble. So let's get stuck into it and see what this bit here is all about. Let's find out if there are, you know, techniques and things which feel dated now or, or perhaps it's going to be an eye-opening experience with techniques I haven't tried or uh, models that I've forgotten that even existed. And I'll be back soon. I get some good humored feedback in the comments field. I was going to call it grief, but it's not grief. It's good. It's good humored about not painting anything. I paint loads. I paint everything. It's just that one flat gray tone that gives the channel its name, unfortunately. But joking aside, I actually love to paint. I think it's one of the most chilled out activities you can do. Uh, maybe if you're trying out a different technique or something and you're finding it tough, it can be a bit frustrating. But I think that if you reach out to YouTube or something and search for a few videos, you can probably find guidance there to get you back on the path to doing that technique a little bit better. And other times it's just a case of do it over and over and over again until you nail it. But generally, painting is a chilled activity. And I just find that the blocker for me is getting started, is actually getting the palette out, squeezing a few blobs of paint onto it, and putting brush to paint and paint to miniature. Once I begin, I generally will obsessively paint for weeks and months. And maybe this will be the thing that gives me the inspiration to actually start into one of my painting binges. And maybe I can start to, you know, put a dent in the hundreds and hundreds of miniatures that I have that are looking back at me with flat gray covering them. That would be something special. Probably be quite a shock to some people, but hey. All right, let's look at this thing. It is the strangest book. It's ring bound. Hardback. Soft front. And the reason it's hardback is because it has this going on. Some really nice Citadel branding there, I've got to say. And the reason it does this is so that you can use it standing. And when you flick through to something you're working on, like say we were working on dry brushing vehicles, you have it stand up like this. There you go. So as you paint, this is what's looking back at you. And you can be like, okay, what's what's next? What's next after I've done this? You can flick over layering example, skin. Or you can have it turned this way. Citadel layer paints. And that's the beauty of it. That's the beauty of this. The, the way they've designed this, they've designed this to be a how to paint guide, but also a usable how to paint guide that has its own little stand for you when you're working. You can just reference it right in front of you, which I think is cracker. Absolutely. Really, really smart. So let's have a look at what we've got on the front here. So up top here, we've got, looks like Dark Eldar, like Drakari, and down below we have, ooh, it's the Army of the Undead, but there's a lot of Egyptian stuff in there. Would that be 
Camry. Yeah, it could be something. Yeah, it could be a Camry army. And then on the back, we have a giant elephant. Well, that is a cool inverted commas miniature. I don't even know what army that is. I'll check it out inside. And then we've got the breakdown. How to assemble, undercoat, all about the Citadel paint system. Don't forget this will be pre-contrast, painting techniques, and example armies. Let's check it out. Okay. So some lovely images here. Probably a bit of nostalgia for some of you folks looking at these things. We've got the Cabal of the Keening Blade here. We've got Faramir leading his warriors through the wilderness of Ithilien. And some lovely examples of the, the miniatures that are talked about inside. So we've got two sections here. We've got army, sorry, the army projects and techniques. Produced by Games Workshop 2014. And how to use this book. And you can see it here, sort of with the sort of the stand with all the lovely pots of paint and everything Citadel branded, of course, the old paint pot there. And then we have that image from the cover again, the Camry. So we get introduction to painting, very straightforward sort of base coat. And then what's this? A wash, dry brush, layer, glaze, and basing. And a nice close up view here of a skeleton getting his head dry brushed. And it will probably go into a bit more detail with techniques and things, I would say. And then we're into all these Citadel branded tools. Get the fine detail cutters, molding remover, the knife, the pin vise, the file set, and the sculpting tool set. And uh, the quality of their stuff is very good from what I've seen. I've used a few bits and pieces Citadel tooling over the years. Do I use much now? No, not really. My clippers I use are Zuron. I use that sweet little Stanley sort of flick and lock knife. I use an army painter pin vise. And I use, you know, generic brand versions of these, the sculpting tools and the files. Like you can get a huge quantity of these for next to nothing. So I think the only Citadel tool I have is this. I didn't get the one with the handle. I got the one that was just the metal. Doesn't even say Citadel on it, but it did come with that Conquest part works that they did for 40k. So I guess that's the only piece I have. And I don't even use that now for getting rid of mold lines. I just use the back of my knife. Does the trick. But nice to see that range. Oh, there's Duncan. Um, formerly of Games Workshop. Got the breakdown of their paintbrushes here. What each of them does. I'm sure the designs of these have changed in the last six years. But really nice uh, bits here just about how to clean your brushes, how to keep them good. And that's really cool. I, I've had awful problems with synthetic brushes from Citadel just sort of curling over. You know, they're just, they're fine. And then they do this at the end and you find yourself almost painting around a corner. And now I, I pretty much use Raphael 8404s for all of the stuff I do with acrylic paints. And if I'm doing enamels or alcohol based, I use Cotman from Windsor Newton Synthetics, which are absolutely fine, reasonably priced, and t seem to hold their, their tip a little bit better. I don't do that much with enamels, I don't do that much with acrylics, but hey, this is what we're talking here about today, right? We're trying to make that better. Anyway, before you paint, getting your seating right, getting your lighting right, even in my own hobby hangouts that I do during the week, there are people there who don't have proper seats. They'll be, they'll be sitting on stools or on like a kitchen chair or something like that with a with a wooden seat and just wonder why they're in such pain after sort of one of our marathon three hour four hour hobby sessions get a good seat folks get something that's going to support your lower back and get you in the right sort of posture and all of that and we have a painting area here um, fully branded to citadel and now we're into the section of the book that you would actually rotate it around put it up on as we stand so that you can have it in front of you as a reference as you work and we start logically with assembling plastic measures, getting it off the sprue, cutting off all the lumpy bits and smoothing off all the seams and things like that, those mold lines. And we can just flip this around to the next page and we're into gluing, uh, test fitting, the types of glue you can use, how to glue small parts, gluing big parts, gluing multiple parts, and all pretty practical. 
Followed by knuckle doing yourself. And then we're into the dreaded Finecast, how to assemble Finecast miniatures. And what is this? It's actually called, it's a, it's a Citadel flash brush. Does anyone own one of these? Because that is just amazing. Like seriously, they took a soft toothbrush and rebranded it. That's just fantastic. I'd love to know how much that cost. Or if someone out there owns one. All about getting it cleaned on the sprue, getting it safely off the sprue, fixing all of the mistakes that were made when it was molded, and then cleaning it. <laughs> it's like, we know these miniatures are garbage, are expensive garbage, and these are all the extra things you have to do. But don't blame us if they fall on the floor and shatter before you have a chance to do anything. And then the next part, test fitting, and then again, gluing small, large, and multiple parts. And then we're into undercoating, and you can see that they are using the classic one glove technique here. It's a really good technique for getting up under the miniatures, getting into all the nooks and crannies. It's also a really great technique for leaving a unprimed thumb and fingerprint on the base. And also a completely coated right hand because there's no glove over here and these nozzles will always dribble. No matter the brand, they always dribble in my, my experience. This is the other technique. Steal a cardboard Amazon box or something off your cats and instead use it for spraying minis in. Use that little sort of self-contained area. After a few seconds though, from out of here, a, just a wall of mist of paint mist will come out at you. So this doesn't last very long. I also tend to find that it overcoats because the all that paint mist is just coming back over the miniatures again. Uh, so I don't know that that's a, a great technique. That would be the technique I would use most, which is the spray sticks. I guess the sticks I use are about two inches wide, quarter inch deep, and I think about sort of 16, maybe 18 inches long. Could even be longer than that. They were off a, a bed that was getting thrown into the dump and I snapped off all the supporting uh, bits of wood that were in two parts across the bed frame and I now have a stack of those that are perfect as, as spray sticks. Uh, and I will just put a little strip of double-sided tape over them, pop the minis on with enough sort of space in between to fit another mini and get spraying generally pretty good and then they talk about sort of spray angles and stuff like that and here we have some troubleshooting uh, uneven coverage spotty finish grainy surface rippled surface all of those things you will experience at one point or another when you're using spray cans but if you get the right type of spray one that you're able to use confidently weather conditions that aren't too windy too humid too cold you just find that sort of Goldilocks condition, you will be able to spray thousands of miniatures without incident. So some of this stuff might feel a bit dated. There might be, you know, old names or something like that, but we get the idea. The range of base paints here. And then it goes in. Oh, that's quite clever. So it shows you the, the base paints within their painting system. And then it goes into actually base coating examples. And they're rather beautifully using it. Blood Angel. But you can see the Empire State Trooper. Okay, we are very dated here. Uh, and then Warrior of Minas Tirith. I don't know the pronunciation. I'm sorry. Lord of the Rings. And here we go. How to do it. How to select which color for which part. And you can, as you can see here, it's it's pretty rough and ready. To give you that feeling if you don't need to be too precise at this point, you can just slap it on. Because you will be going over that later on anyway. Uh, and then we went straight from base coating. Oh, okay. I guess this is still base coating because you can use a spray gun. This is their hand flamer spray gun, which is just hilarious that they went with a design as aggressive as that. Um, hopefully that's picking up. And you can see a Predator tank there down the bottom right. How to spray. I've always struggled with spraying vehicles. I always find them a challenge to get under all the nooks and crannies and generally have to go back to it, you know, lean it on its side or something like that because putting it onto a spray stick 
it doesn't tend to work for me. And then it shows them using the uh, spray flamer thing or whatever it's called on a, you know, minis on a painting stick here. If anyone has an experience of using one of those, you know, add it into the comments below. It doesn't look to be the most reliable unit in the world, but maybe it was uh, actually better in, in practice. And then speaking of vehicles, we have some camo pattern effects here, how to do it. We've got, you know, blue tack, like poster putty, um, masking tape here as well. And that's kind of neat getting that covered up and doing another spray. And then I guess you could reposition them and go again and get some really cool camo techniques. We're into the shades. You see the range here. Uh, wash down to a model to create areas of darker color, defining details and good old null oil there in the, the small size pot. Liquid talent up in the top left. And then into some examples of how to wash armor. Are we still with the... Okay, we've switched over to an orc model now. So that's kind of good. They, they go through each one with different types of models. And you can see uh, the different type... Um, the different stages here and different parts of the mini and how it's being used. And it's nice and close up. I mean, it's quite dark, the imagery, but you can still see the brush here um, going on to the, the chain mail. And then we can see other ways of using shades, uh, section washing, washing over white, robes and cloths all over washing. So I guess this is the, the dip technique effectively. And then we're into the dry compounds. Never had much luck with Citadel's dry range. I'd always much rather just buy a regular paint and have complete control over the dryness, the, the level of pigmentation on the, the brush, just by wiping it on a piece of kitchen roll. And at least I then have a usable paint. I would say, you know, I have, so I have it usable as it is, it's a normal paint, but I can also use it as a dry paint. When you buy one of these, they're only good as a dry paint. They're, it's just weird. But anyway, maybe different strokes for different folks. Uh, and then we have some dry brushing examples here. How to dry brush a vehicle, which is cool. I like the showing the direction of the brush here, the technique, how it picks up certain areas. You can get these panel effects here, these highlight effects. So that's kind of nice. And then look at this page here, which is the main paint range. We've got the layer paints. And you can see some examples here of uh, three types of miniatures from their three featured ranges within this book on how uh, the different layering techniques can work. And one of the hardest things that I always find to paint was skin to get that get the tone, the shadows, the highlights looking smooth. And you can see how they've they've gone in the very straightforward steps here. And it goes through um, cloth here as well. And then we are into glazes. So what what is this? A kind of washer ink that is specially formulated to intensify color. So I don't know a huge amount about those. Okay, so they're translucent already. Not a huge amount in it. There's just the four colors, but it does cover the three primaries. So I guess you can make it into whatever you want to be. Now we can see an example of them doing how to stain armor with no glaze and then glaze and then the blood letter. The... Okay, so this is green, red, and blue showing you what uh, the different three of the facts are. It's fine. And then we're into texture paints here. Texture is some of the most interesting paints around. Uh, the range has expanded from this now. We got like lava effects. There's another astro granite. There's a bunch of other stuff. And down here we have like grasses and things you can put on. Uh, tufts. You got the Citadel branded PVA glue there. Just go buy a huge thing of, you know, go into like um, art and hobby type of shop. Look for where the, you know, the children's glue is, the school glue, non-branded. You'll get like a huge bottle of it for next to nothing. It's exactly the same stuff. It'll do exactly the same job. Goes on white, dries clear. If you get it on your hands, it's not like super glue. It just rubs away. It's fantastic. And then we have a nice example of a based miniature showing the different steps and how to get it, get that effect. 
You can see the PVA glue going on white here. You got them adding the grass to it. And then we have a different one here replicating the terrain of the Pelennor Plains from Lord of the Rings. How to do that, the different types of paint and stuff to use. He's putting these little tufts down. So I do have a thing about putting tufts right in front of where your miniature's feet are. I think that if we're all using the same tufts in the same places on these 25 or 32 mil bases, it's just going to get, look so generic. So just like everyone else's work. I mean, by all means, put something on the base, which makes it special to you, like a, like a half buried skull or something in the dirt or shell casings or a discarded magazine or a, a busted up helmet or something like that. Even a severed foot. Hey, if, if tufts are what you love to put on bases, then you get tufty. But don't do it just because Citadel tell you to do it. Don't, don't just, you don't have to brush on Tyrant's skull here. You could brush on, hey, you could, you could soak this in blood for the blood god and have splashes of blood all up their coats. It's your mini. You do it whatever way you want. Don't even need to listen to me. Nobody needs to listen to me. So something I touched on in the review I did of the Haynes model building manual, which I'll link down below, was a really cool section on applying decals and transfers. Uh, check out what Haynes say about that. Their instructions were pretty detailed, and it looks like this is pretty detailed as well. Showing you how to prepare the surface of the miniature, how to prepare the actual transfer itself. Now as we flip this over, how to apply it and how to make sure that it's protected. So that's really nice. I like that. And here we have some special effects techniques, rust and verdigris. Uh, and it's easy to call these like advanced techniques or something like that, but really they're not. They're just for that next level of detail, more than being any more difficult to do than any of the other techniques. And you can see they've gone for a sort of a brown effect here lightened it up with lighter brown and then topped it off with this troll slayer orange to give it that you know really fresh rust kind of look and then verdigris is just the, the same sort of flow but with this light green to give that kind of um oxidization what is that copper oxide comes out like that and then here we have chipping and weathering as another couple of special effects. And chipping really is just what it sounds like. It's, it's paint chipping off. So if you have like a metal gun and it's painted black, chipping will just look through like the, the bare metal. So you'll have little streaks of gun metal showing through or sort of silvery metal like they have here showing through. And it's just the flow of how to do that. And if you look at the uh, weapon or the clothing or the, the vehicle and think, well, where is it most likely to get worn away? Where is it most likely to receive sort of um, abrasion and damage? Like, for example, around the trigger guard here or around the edges of the vehicle, maybe where it's reversed into something or, you know, um, where the, the shoes have been scuffed or something like that. And uh, apply a bit of practical common sense to it you can get a really realistic effect shining through there. Touches on batch painting with sub-assemblies. So um, gradually going through the miniature as you're building it and painting certain sections. It's funny, I got a Tamiya kit recently, one of their World War II kits. I'm, I'm using it for parts and going to do some heavy sort of modifying on it to make it look, you know, 41st millennium. But in the instructions for it, it talks about painting each piece before you glue it. Or as you're gluing it into its assembly, you're painting it as you go, which I think is just amazing. I think that's the, the amount of work involved in that is really incredible. And it, you know, you could, because you would have to glue it into place, you know, prime it by hand, let that dry, and then put your color in and your, you know, shading and highlights and everything before moving on to the next piece that you clip off the sprue and glue on. That would be a nightmare for me. It would take me forever to do anything, but I suppose it would guarantee that everything gets painted. This is similar, but not quite as extreme as that about painting within sub-assemblies. And there's an example of batch painting as well. 
So this would be batch print painting units on regimental bases, which is the way they used to display, I think, with um, Warhammer Fantasy. And kind of cool. You know, they, they just kind of spray everything here with this, uh, what is the Zandri dust probably? Yeah, with Zandri dust, they base coat the whole lot. And that's kind of neat, just doing it as one job rather than whatever that is, 10 individual ones. Skeletons have always been pretty straightforward. And I think how you approach these projects is going to increase the likelihood you're going to complete them. If you think about how you work best, if you work best on like a factory line of painting, where you're going to do all of that tone of red across the entire, you know, unit or army or team or whatever it might be. I'm going to do all of those. They'll all be done when I get to the end. I'll then go back to miniature number one and go on to my, you know, dark red for my shadows or my null oil wash. And I'll wash all of the bits that I've done on all of the miniatures. Maybe that works for you. It's certainly the way I used to paint the Blood Bowl teams. But you were really sick of that color by the time you got to like the 10th, the 11th miniature. Maybe for you, you prefer to just do one miniature at a time, do the complete job on each one. It doesn't really work for me, but it might work for you. So I think whatever increases the likelihood you're going to complete it, or complete it to the standard that you are aiming for, then go with that. If it's this, if you want to do them in a huge batch, just get them tabletop ready, you know, get your... Spray on your base coat, coat them all in like null oil or um, Agrax Earth Shade, and then do some sort of highlight and be like, yep, we're good. And that's cool. Uh, for me, I like to take a bit of time, but in that sort of production line kind of approach. Anyway, so really that's the end of the first section. That's all the, what did they call it at the beginning? the techniques. So that's section one all on techniques. And then we're into section two, which is army projects. And it's broken up into Tyranids, Harad. Oh, is that the one with the elephants? Okay, so I that was the one from the back of the book that I didn't know. It's called Harad. I've never heard of that. So, so apologies if that's your army of choice. Uh, Space Marines, Gondor, Orcs and Goblins, the Empire, Tomb Kings and Dark Eldar. Uh, so those are the eight armies. Yeah, so those are the eight armies they look at and um, give you a rundown on sort of a sample project. And, and here we have, it's kind of nice as so we've got an introduction to High, Field, High Fleet Kraken. Shows you some sample miniatures. Uh, and that's kind of cool. Hopefully it does that for each of them. And I imagine it does. And you've got a little bit of the branding here showing you the the Gene Stealer logo, and it just says Tyranids, Tyranids up there. And then we're into the side sideways again. So I don't need to go through these in, in, in a huge amount of detail. It uses the same Citadel paint system as was described before. So you can see how the knowledge can be transferable from how to get these different tones, how to get these effects. You know, it doesn't have to be for Tyranids, you could use that in anything. Uh, and then it goes through the different ranges of miniatures, uh, right up to the, the big dude there, the, the Trigon, which is incredible. And it then shows a lovely image of a fully painted, fully assembled army. So that's kind of neat. And then we get on to Orcs and Goblins with the Ironskins tribe. And again, nice little uh, thing about the inspiration here that the painter used when he was uh, selecting the paint scheme and everything. And a little bit of a touch of lore here. And then again, sort of techniques and things. Now again, we get into uh, the various sort of structure behind the, the colors and the plan to follow. And just get that, look at that lovely artwork right at the end. That's beautiful. Nice scenery there as well. I mean, you see, it's it's simply constructed, but it's just beautifully done. Even this little house here over on the left. That's lovely. And then we're into the Harad here, and you can see that wonderful elephant. Looks like this um, army was painted by Duncan Rhodes himself. Uh, some really nice artwork here. This is an interesting army, actually. I wonder if they still around in any shape or form. 
but um, this sort of nice bronzy sort of effect here too, which is kind of cool. And you can go through each of these armies, look at how the bases are done, and pick whichever one works for the miniatures you're working on and go with that technique. It's really nice. And then we into the showcase images. I mean, this this elephant war Mumak of Harad. Isn't that just spectacular? Hopefully that's picking up on camera. Got some really nice details of it there as well. And then the showcase image. That's just beautiful. Really beautiful. Ah, that Mumak is something else. And here we have the armies of the empire. This is army of Reichland. Reichland I know from the Reichland Reavers, which is the most successful Blood Bowl team of all time. It'd be cool to see when we get the old world back up and running, if armies like this make a reappearance. It'd be interesting to see what new models they can come up with. And we've got good reference points here. There's, there's a one particular type of flesh tone. You could follow that plan there. You got reds and greens, which are great. You can see sort of the different layers and tones, yellow and blue here. So this is actually, this is a really useful section for those very straightforward colors, those very popular colors. You now have a reference point of how to do that, how to highlight and shadow it. And then we get into that nice showcase image, which is just lovely. Again, some lovely buildings in these. Really pretty. So now we're into familiar territory again with the Adeptus Astartes, the Space Marines, an incredibly familiar territory here with Ultramarines, but this is, I think, a different chapter. Yeah, so this is about the Aurora chapter here. This is the one that, again, Duncan chose to, to paint, uh, which has got this amazing sort of green armor with, you know, gold details and um, the white and black logo there. And it goes through, which is kind of cool. Standard troops, a tank, you know, got the standard um, rhino there, and a dreadnought too. So again, useful as a reference point for like glowing weapons, green armor, these sort of gold highlights, uh, how to do a purity seal, how to do like muzzle detail there and damage, and skin tones panel lining here for the um, armor, as well as some um, weapons too. So useful reference points for sure. Uh, and then you can actually see that really nice Rhino. Dreadnought looks fantastic, of course. And then a much different battlefield to the other ones there from Fantasy Battle. This is a grim, dark, ruined world. And then we're into the Camry, so nice stuff here with this sort of bronze and gold tones, some lovely artwork. Painting skeletons, always useful. <laughs> Their shields. We got like leather, metal, basing. Oh, this is nice, this sort of um, gold on this, this is sort of deep blue. And the gold on top of that, that's really nice. Just give you a little bit of a Closer up look at that. It's a really nice effect. That's lovely. Actually, lovely palette there, lovely contrast. And the Necro Sphinx. Oh, maybe that's what that detail was from. That is gorgeous. Wow. Love to see the Tomb Kings back. Especially with miniatures like that. Beautiful. And then the set piece there. All these, you know, collapsed ruined buildings. I wonder if they make those custom for this image or whether they were available at the time. And then we are into the uh, Lord of the Rings stuff, the army of Minas Tirith. Sorry if that pronunciation is wrong. And just again, goes through a little bit of the inspiration behind the paint job. The, how they were assembled, techniques and everything. And then we have how they did up the armor here, the, the detail work, the swords and gloves and leather. Just there's pretty much reference for 
all of the main things you would need to paint in here. It's, it's actually really handy. So the, the fact that it's six years old doesn't matter. Leather's still leather, skin's still skin, and ultramarines are still ultramarines. Uh, but that's lovely too. These dioramas are just beautifully put together. And now we're into the Dark Eldar, the Cabal of the Keening Blade. These people are always so creepy. All assembled up in bare plastic there, which is nice to see. You don't see these images like this very often in Warhammer stuff. Normally they'll only ever show their miniatures fully painted. For sure you get them on sprues, I think, on their web store, but you wouldn't really see them as bare plastic as far as I, as far as I know. So it's, it's cool to see that. And some of their sort of typical colorings. Like this is, I mean, they sort of talk at the beginning here about their inspiration for this painter doing this, this job. And that's just for their particular take on this army. Obviously there's a bunch of different factions and armies within each of these races we've looked at. So you just take what you need from this and go where you want it. So we have a different skin tone here. There's much paler skin tone, which would be good for vampires too. And these, wow, that Talos pain engine is pretty neat. I wonder what size that base is and how little the contact point there is on that base. That's um, concerning, but actually I have no idea how that's standing up. Unless there's a support strut or something I'm not seeing there. Uh, we've also got this skiff thing called a raider. That's some serious armament on that. I'm loving this dude just sitting at the back like, on with Jeeves, kill them all. Oh, and finally we have another one of these beautiful showcases of the army. That is really lovely. Truly, truly lovely. I, I like how they've gone for, we're evil, so let's make our paint scheme evil. How evil can we make ourselves look? Yeah, this'll do it. This hits it right on the money. Red eyes, you say, let's go with that. <laughs> Great. Okay, and this is the color guide. It'd be interesting to actually see a comparison between this and what we currently have six years on. You know, what if this has disappeared? What is, um, how far out has it expanded? Because obviously there's no, even for contrast paints, none of them are here. They wouldn't have been, we're a few years away from that appearing. Uh, some more lovely um, set piece images here. Again, just loving these buildings and scenery. That's gorgeous. There we have some more of those beautiful green marines and filthy Xenos down below. And that's it. That's the end of the book. It just sort of suddenly it's over. So I'm not sure if it's taught me anything new regards technique, but for color palette, it's really solid reference point. And because they're using recognize citadel paint names i have a you know i can check my racks here to see if i actually have that one or i can hold it up against the rack to see if i have a, maybe another brand's version of it that's that's close enough to keep do to what this is is telling me to do so yeah for me it's that great reference point for all of those colors the end result and how to get there for others it may be a, a technique reference manual it may be their start point or it might just be a bit of nostalgia looking back through all of these old armies and old ranges. It has only been six years, but the last six years in particular have been a generational shift for Citadel, for Warhammer, for Games Workshop. It is a different animal to what it was in 2014 and continues to evolve at an incredibly fast rate. So I stand by it. It's, it's got a bit of nostalgia in there. 
even looking at the paint system, there may be paints in there. You're like, oh, do you remember when we had that paint? And you might look at your own rack now and be like, okay, there are now four greens in and around that color that bracket it that weren't there at all before. And a whole brand new range of contrast paints and dear knows what else that have come onto the market in the last six years. And that really wraps it up for this episode. Next time on Grey Primer, we're going for another one of those four day weekends of content. And it is going to be just tanks, four days of tanks. We've got tanks from Warhammer, from Shield Wolf Miniatures, and from Raging Heroes. So we've got the UK, Greece, and France all represented in the tank showdown next weekend. Uh, I'm really looking forward to that. Hey, like, share, subscribe if you enjoy this content. The channel's been pretty slow to grow, I gotta say, but I'm getting content in here every weekend. And for the faithful viewers who stay right to this point in the video, I appreciate you more than you can imagine. Uh, if you can, share it with like-minded people and it will really help the channel to continue to grow. And it'll really help me out. It'll be fantastic. Please switch on notifications by clicking the little bell if you want to find out when the new content has landed. It's normally a Friday afternoon, Irish time, but until the next time, take care and I'll see you soon. Bye-bye.